1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Good morning, Taz Car Insurance. How can I help you? Hello, I was wondering if you could give me a quote for my car, please. I'd like to insure it for a period of 12 months. Certainly. I need to take down a few details first of all. Can I have your name, please? Certainly. It's James Bartolo. Sorry, can you say that again, please? Sure. James Bartolo. That's B-A-R-T-O-L-O. OK, thanks. And your date of birth? It's the 1st of the 8th, 1973. Great. And can you give me your address, please? Sure. It's 146 Eastern Road, Chester. Fabulous. Now, is the insurance for just yourself? No. Actually, my wife drives the car, too. Her name is Alice Jackson, and her date of birth is the 23rd of the 4th, 1968. That's OK. I just need to write yes or no and the make and model of the car you wish to insure. It's a 1998 Ford Laser. OK. And do you have any idea of the value of the car? Yes, it's around £4,000. I only bought it about a week ago. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. OK. And do either you or your wife have any previous convictions or disqualifications? I'm sorry we have to ask this question, but of course it affects the price of the insurance cover. Not a problem. No, actually we both have clean driving licences. Nothing so far, touch wood. Good. So I can write none for that question. Now, who were you previously insured with? Uh, with Aitken Insurance. I'm sorry, could you spell that? Yes, it's A-I-T-K-E-N. I actually have a three years no claims bonus too. Great. That will bring the price down a little for you too. OK, if you just give me a few minutes, I'll work out a price for you now. That looks like it will be £275 per year. That sounds good to me. Can I pay for that now over the telephone? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a radio program on the process of making beer. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hello and welcome to Gourmet Evening. And this week we're looking at the world's popular beverage, a great favourite today, beer. And in the studio to tell us all about it is Clark Maxwell. Beer is one of my personal favourite beverages. And I've got a number of facts, tips and trivia about beer to share with you. So, who invented beer and when? What is beer made of? 
Actually, historians are not entirely sure when beer was invented, but they guess that beer was created accidentally by early nomadic tribes roughly 10,000 years ago. The four primary ingredients are malt, hops, yeast, and water. Malt, which gives the beer a sweet taste, is made from barley soaked in water until its husks open and sprout. The sprouts are then dried and crushed. The small flowers of the hops vine are added partly because they taste bitter, helping balance the sweetness of the malt. Hops prevent the growth of bacteria that can spoil beer. Yeast is responsible for fermentation, which creates the alcohol and carbonation. Beer makers sometimes use additives or substitutes for malt or hops. Substitutes such as corn or rice can make a beer lighter or cheaper to produce. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Adding fruit gives beer a fruity taste. Beer is not high in alcohol, as we know. The lowest type light beer contains no more than 2% alcohol, and the highest may reach 6%. Other drinks such as wine are more alcoholic. Wine contains 8 to 20% alcohol. But that is not to say drinking beer is no danger at all. Like all alcoholic beverages, beer can make it difficult to drive and think clearly. Excessive drinking can also lead to liver damage, high blood pressure, stomach ulcers, and other health problems. However, beer also helps prevent some health problems when consumed in moderation. Beer contains a moderate number of vitamins and minerals. Studies have shown that small amounts of alcohol can reduce the risk of heart disease. Beer also contains selenium, a mineral that promotes bone growth and helps reduce the risk of osteoporosis. I suppose many of you think beer can give you a beer belly, but you are mistaken. Genes determine how fat is deposited. No food or drink can create fat deposits in specific areas of the body. As with all foods, the more calories you consume, the more likely they are to be stored as fat and cause weight gain. Beer contains no fat and averages 150 calories per serving. Well, one more thing. Pay attention to the storage and containers of beer. They will affect its taste. It's a mistake that the taste of beer improves with age, like that of some wines. Beer is a food product that will eventually become stale. It should be stored in a cool, dark location before consumption, and the color of a bottle can influence the flavor. Brown bottles block out light that reacts with the hops, which could damage the flavor. Green or clear bottles provide little or no protection from light damage. Do you know which country drinks the most beer? Although Britain is even on the list of big consumers, actually the Czech Republic consumes the most beer at 156 liters per person per year, followed by Ireland and Germany. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear the rest of the talk about family history. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, that's a few ideas about getting information, but what about methods of recording it? Of course, you can just write down what family members say, but it's even better if you can use a tape, so that you can record them as they're talking. Then you don't have to worry too much about making mistakes. You'll always be able to listen to it again. But whatever method you do use to record information, Remember that it's very important to make a note of exactly how you got it. So, if you are using tape, always start the recording by saying the date and the place, as well as the name of the person you're interviewing. So, apart from people's memories, where else can you find information? Well, there are all sorts of documents, and they can be extremely useful. People keep lots of kinds of documents in the home, like uh, photos or letters or diaries or birth certificates. And some people keep things from newspapers, like obituaries. Obituaries are announcements of a person's death, and they usually contain a lot of detail about that individual, like address, occupation, date of death as well as the names and ages of the widow or widower and the dead person's children. So, be creative. Look around your home or the home of your relatives for any items that might contain clues, such as these about your family history. OK? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, you'll find that you'll collect a lot of information, so you'll need to record it in an organised way. I'd recommend that you use an ancestor chart, uh, like this one here. <laughs> Can you all see? Yeah. Ancestor charts act like maps. They link four or five generations in a family tree, so they're very convenient, and they don't cost anything. You can get as many as you like, you just download them free from the internet. Then you fill them out as you go along, and for each individual you record all the key information next to their full name. <laughs> it's very convenient. Now, at this point, I'd just like to give you a couple of tips about filling in the ancestor sheet. First of all, I'd advise you to use pencil, at least until you have definite evidence for the information you're recording. Secondly, as well as recording official names, I mean given names, it's worth writing any nicknames down. You know, these are the short names that people call you when they know you very well and you can show them by using quotation marks. That's ancestor charts, then. They really do save a lot of work. Now, before I show you how to go about confirming the information you've collected... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about a crater in Australia. First, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Lake Ackerman in South Australia is Armageddon for the purist. No other meteorite impact on Earth has stamped the surrounding rocks with such an abiding, unequivocal geological record of collision, earthquake, wind, fire and tsunami, the giant waves formed by major Earth movements. The story it tells is elemental, without dying dinosaurs or even Bruce Willis to complicate its simple message of destruction. First, the numbers. About 590 million years ago, a rocky meteorite more than four kilometres across and travelling at around 90,000 kilometres an hour slammed into an area of red volcanic rock about 430 kilometres northwest of Adelaide. Within seconds, the meteorite vaporised in a ball of fire, carving out a crater about four kilometres deep and 40 kilometres in diameter, and spawning earthquakes fierce enough to raise 100 metre height tsunamis in a shallow sea 300 kilometres away. Ancient, stable and unglaciated, the bedrock of Australia preserves some of the most photogenic impact craters in the world. Ackerman is not one of them. Half a billion years of erosion has taken its toll. A salt pan surrounded by low hills is all that remains to mark the site of the cataclysm. The true nature of the place dawned on geologist George Williams of Adelaide University in 1979. Gazing at a sheaf of newly acquired satellite images, he saw the small circular shape of Lake Ackerman surrounded by a ring of faults and low scarps 40 kilometres across and an outer ring twice this size. A year later, he made it to the site. On islands near the centre of the lake, Williams found bedrock shattered in a conical pattern that experts consider a sure sign of a meteorite impact. Except for a crater, which had long since eroded, the area was a textbook example of an impact site. In 1985, further intriguing evidence turned up. Vic Gostin, another Adelaide geologist, had been studying a thin band of fragmented red volcanic rock in 600 million year old shale in the Flinders Ranges, more than 300 kilometres east of Ackerman. To his bewilderment, the volcanic chunks turned out to be a billion years older than the shale. Where had they come from? Comparing samples, Gostin and Williams found that their rocks were identical. The red rock in the Flinders Ranges had been blasted there from Ackerman. Later, the same material turned up at sites 500 kilometres from Ackerman. Everywhere, the bands of fragments showed the same structure. Coarse pebbles at the bottom, then a cocktail of silt and sand, then layers of increasingly fine sand distorted on top into a wavy, scalloped pattern. These layers also show, step by step, how the meteorite transformed the floor of an ancient sea hundreds of kilometres away, according to Malcolm Wallace of Melbourne University. First came the earthquake. Travelling at about three kilometres a second, shock waves arrived offshore within a minute or two of the collision, stirring up the water with clouds of silt as the seabed shook. Then shattered rock from the explosion arrived by air. Pebbles and boulders crashed into the water, reaching a depth of about 200 metres within a minute. One day they would become the lower band of the Flinders Rock. Sand took up to an hour to come to rest, finally bedding down with the silt that was also now settling on the sea floor, as the effects of the earthquake died away. This mixture would eventually form the next layer. About an hour after the meteorite's impact, huge waves rolled in, leaving the ripples on the surface that later hardened into rock. Clear as mud is not an oxymoron. In Ackerman, the arid, timeless Australian outback 
has preserved the closest thing the earth can boast to a perfect pockmark, the pinnacle of imperfection. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. If you're in it now, I keep making sound. Go another round. Bitch, I'm looking bound. Can't stop me now.